All right, I want to welcome everyone. This is the International Societies for Vaccines webinar series. Uh, this is a new series that the ISV has started, and our inaugural presentation is today by Dr. Peter Palazzi. We want to thank you all um, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Palazzi is a professor in microbiology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is a um, formed his career on looking at RNA viruses, particularly influenza viruses. Uh, he's been involved in some seminal publications uh, over the years, including uh, the lead authors on uh, resurrecting the 1918 extinct uh, pandemic virus using a technique pioneered in their laboratories with reverse genetics, which is now common in many laboratories across the world. He has been involved in multiple different uh, studies and projects over the years, and he's going to tell us about some of the current studies they're doing on universal vaccines and how the, what are the challenges associated with these vaccines uh, development programs across the world. So, Dr. Palazzi, thank you. You're our inaugural speaker, and we're really honored to have you give the presentation today. For those that would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand during the thing, and at the end, we'll take questions, and I will unmute you and allow you to uh, ask your question orally. If you'd like to also type it in the chat, that is also fine in case we run out of time. So Dr. Palazzi, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ross. We will discuss today the development of a universal influenza virus vaccine. And what I mean by that is, as we will hear, we have to actually be revaccinated every year and to avoid that, we would like to have a universal influenza virus vaccine, which is given, let's say, once every 20 years or even once a lifetime, like we have many other vaccines, mumps, measles, et cetera. So uh, that is uh, the uh, definition of a, or our definition of a universal influenza virus vaccine, that it would certainly be lasting longer than just one year or two years, uh, hopefully 20 years or even longer. When we talk about influenza, always comes up the uh, terrible situation about 100 years ago, namely the uh, Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918. It has actually not nothing to do with Spain. Uh, it was called Spanish flu because the only country in Europe and the US at the time which was not under uh, military censorship was Spain, which was at the time a neutral, and the newspapers were able to report of influenza, on influenza, and then it became a Spanish influenza, even though it was in all of the other countries as well, but again, the military censorship didn't allow uh, writing about it. And you can see in this Camp Funston uh, photograph from 1918, uh, where we have uh, uh, if it's not hundreds, but dozens of uh, people who have been effect affected. And uh, one can see that this is not a very healthy uh, environment, uh, both for the patients as well as of the hospital personnel. One other uh, slide, which uh, you have probably seen already, is the life expectancy expectancy in the United States over the last 100 years, starting with 1900, uh, both female and male. And we start around 1900 with a life expectancy of about 40, a little bit higher than 40 years. And it goes so steadily up. And I think in 2024, a female has way over 80 years in terms of a life expectancy. That was not the case, but we'll, what, what we see on this slide here is there is a major dip in 1918 of about 11 years in terms of the life expectancy. And that has nothing to do with World War I. It is really uh, an effect of the, uh, let's call it Spanish flu uh, in terms of death. And uh, it really uh, was a terrible uh, outcome. We had more death in the United States Army from influenza as compared to military activity and military actions. So this is quite interesting uh, that we uh, have this major dip in uh, life expectancy 
in the country about three quarters of a million people died and we had only about 100 million people at the time. So it is quite a dramatic uh, uh, effect. Uh, and we have uh, worldwide, our numbers are that we have probably worldwide death uh, due to the 1918, 1919 influenza of about five, 50 to 100 million people dead. Uh, I'm not belittling the uh, terrible SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic, which we had, but worldwide so far in the last uh, four years now, uh, we have actually uh, only 7 million, I don't want to say only, but we have 7 million deaths. So the influenza death rate in 1918, 1919 uh, was quite something. The topic today is we want to make uh, vaccines. And you will be surprised to know that in 1919, 1918, 1919, a company namely Wellcome uh, was actually selling a vaccine against influenza. And it consisted of 10 million uh, bacillus influenza uh, bacteria. And it was given uh, against influenza, uh, even though, as we know now, uh, as we now know, it had nothing to do with the bacterium. Uh, bacillus influenza is actually uh, a, bacill a bacterium which is involved in otitis media and can be uh, systemic, but it is certainly not the major cause of uh, viral influenza or even um, pneumonia, etc. But it is important to know that because welcome. Uh, and it uh, is uh, had uh, as an item to uh, sell this bacterial vaccine, uh, and it was actually uh, a bacillus which was found by Pfeiffer in 1892. And uh, again, as I said, uh, this was nothing which was uh, uh, which helped really in terms of. Um, the, taking that vaccine against influenza. It is also quite interesting that the um, bacillus, uh, which we were, uh, which was given uh, by the company Wellcome, is actually the pre, uh, is a company which is now uh, uh, was bought by uh, by the conglomerate of GSK. GlaxoSmithKline actually uh, has uh, bought all the Wellcome shares. And it's interesting <laughs> that GSK nowadays has again an influenza virus vaccine, but made against the real uh, pathogen. The real pathogen is actually a virus, and it is a virus which is uh, an RNA virus and has on the surface uh, what we refer to as the hemagglutinin uh, or the antineuraminidase. Uh, H for hemagglutinin, neuraminid, N for neuraminidase, and we have uh, quite a lot of uh, different subtypes, and we will see this is one of the uh, problems which we have. Uh, the subtypes uh, for hemagglutinin are quite, um, we have quite a lot, of, uh, even though uh, we have only a few of these hemagglutinin, like H1, H2, and H3, which have been in the human population. And inside, we can see these um, uh, electron dense structures. Uh, it's seven, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one in the middle. So these are the eight RNAs, the eight uh, RNA segments, which code for the proteins of influenza virus. Now, it started about 20 years ago that uh, we were able to, uh, as Dr. Ross already mentioned, uh, we have. Um, a, uh, well, I think it's a, it's a major achievement. We have been able to reconstruct the 1918 virus. And that was possible, <coughs> sorry, that was possible uh, by uh, the following, um, by, the, by the following um, material, which was available from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And this is a long block a paraffin from a soldier who died of uh, influenza and uh, from material, but there's this dark material, which is the tissue of the lung. 
uh, it was possible for for a Taubenberger, uh, for Jeffrey Taubenberger to get the sequence of this 1918 virus. And then we used the sequence of the 1918 virus, taking advantage of the uh, uh, of taking advantage of the uh, reverse genetics methodology, which was actually mentioned by Dr. Ross, where we <laughs> express the eight RNA segments and uh, of the uh, eight RNAs and then protein plasmids, which are the polymerase, which consists of PV2, PV1, PA, and MP, and one transfects this, and out one can get recombinant influenza virus. It's not a very effective um, way of actually uh, generating this virus, but we only need one virus particle and we can amplify it. And uh, so even, <coughs> I'm sorry, even a, a very um, inefficient inefficient way of rescuing uh, allowed us to make uh, this virus uh, in the in in the laboratory and uh, this was a paper which uh, uh, was uh, the Lancet paper of the year in 2500 it's almost uh, 20 years ago and uh, we were able uh, uh, Tumpy from the CDC is the first author because he actually rescued, we made all the uh, plasmids, et cetera, and he rescued this in a BSL-4 facility because we didn't know whether this virus was specifically um, more dangerous than other viruses. But we learned quite a lot about this virus. We understand now why it was so virulent. And uh, I think we, uh, and we, we found out that it can be inhibited by presently available antivirals. It is uh, also susceptible to vaccine making, to vaccines which are made by our procedures. So all of that I think was very positive. Now, uh, we uh, want to understand why it is so difficult to make better vaccines. And uh, there are 18 different influenza virus hemagglutinin subtypes. I said only three so far have been actually uh, found in humans. The other 15 have been found in animals, uh, mostly birds, but also bats. And uh, we have basically, uh, in the back of our minds, is the possibility that not only the three known human hemagglutinin subtypes, H1, H2, and H3, but also uh, the other 15 could actually lead to a pandemic virus, an epidemic virus, which is global. So that's what we are afraid of. And we actually understand quite a lot now from sequencing data, what these different influenza virus hemagglutinins are. And uh, uh, this shows a, a dendrogram, uh, which uh, was made by Florian Kramer. Uh, and the bar is 7%. And then we have the two different groups, a group one and the group two. And we have here H1, H2, and here H3, which are the only uh, human hemagglutinins which have been obtained or have been found in the last 100 years. But there are all these other uh, different ones, a total of 18, as I mentioned before. Uh, in terms of influenza A viruses, we have these different uh, 18 subtypes, but we also have influenza B viruses and also people can be infected by these. So it's a, it's a complicated situation. Uh, uh, I would like to mention also that it is similar to what we experience now in terms of SARS coronavirus 2. So uh, the same dendrogram, the same uh, evolutionary tree, which we have here for the hemagglutinins, uh, one can also establish for the spike protein of coronaviruses. And again, the bar, which uh, is here shown for the flu for 7%, uh, we can also um, see that we have uh, we have different uh, hemagglutinins, which may uh, pop up. But again, so far, we have not been uh, fortunately threatened with any uh, easily transmissible influenza virus belonging to one any of these different uh, subtypes. 
as I mentioned, our coronaviruses are in a similar situation. And if we look here on the uh, here the dark uh, bluish um, tree, we have SARS coronavirus two, the Omicron, and we have the uh, common cold viruses. They are all very close here, and uh, you can see there are many other uh, coronaviruses, namely the uh, gamma, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, viruses which can also theoretically cause a similar pandemic as we have seen it uh, since the beginning of the, of 2020. So this is what we are afraid of uh, in terms of coronaviruses, very similar situation. We don't understand really why influenza only has been restricted in humans to H1, H2, and H3. Uh, we don't know why we don't have H5s in humans, et cetera. And the same is also true for coronaviruses. We have, again, as I mentioned, this 7% uh, diff uh, amino acid difference. So uh, if we compare, for example, this SARS coronavirus 2 to this other uh, uh, coronaviruses here, we can see there are 7% and maybe another 7 So they are 14% different, but there are many other which are even much more different and we really don't understand why these coronaviruses have not jumped uh, effectively into humans as SARS coronavirus 2 has starting in January of uh, 2020. So this is uh, sort of just uh, uh, mentioning that uh, uh, coronavirus is similar in a way. It's at least as different. Uh, we have all kinds of animals uh, uh, harboring these coronaviruses, like influenza viruses, can many different uh, viruses, of, of many, viruses of many different influenza types are found in animals. So uh, if we go back to the human influenza viruses, we should understand that in 1918, based on the sequence, we know we had H1N1, uh, and these actually uh, were going until H2N2 in 57, in 68, H3N2 uh, viruses came about, and then in 2009, we had suddenly another H1N1 virus uh, appearing here, uh, and then we had also uh, H1 viruses uh, popping up in 1977. They died out in 2009. So in this uh, particular year here, 2024, 20, we have influenza B viruses up here. We have pandemic H1N1 viruses. We have H3 and 2 viruses. And uh, as you will see, we have, uh, in terms of the present vaccine, 1H3, uh, 1H1, and then there are actually two different influenza B viruses. Uh, lineages. So that's what we have. And uh, you can see it's a complex situation. We don't know how long these viruses will stay with us, whether a new one comes about. Uh, the question mark is a real question mark. Even people like me who have been involved uh, in uh, many different aspects of influenza for many, many years, we really don't understand what the future will, will hold. And uh, we have a saying in New York City, uh, Yogi Berra, uh, it's always difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So we really don't know uh, what's going on uh, and whether they will die out. There's no periodicity. One of these H2N2 viruses was present for 11 years. Uh, H3N2 is now almost 60 years. So it's really very, very difficult to uh, make predictions, and uh, we are really uh, at a loss, unfortunately. So influenza virus vaccines are unique, and I mentioned this already, uh, they have to be given uh, annually because novel vaccine formulations are prepared, uh, are needed, uh, because uh, they have to reflect the antigenic changes of the virus. And uh, this is something very different. It's the only virus which has to be given every year. And as I mentioned, there are vaccines which are, which have a long duration and protect us for a lifetime. Now, 
uh, what kinds of influenza virus vaccines do we have? I want to say up front, we have better influenza virus vaccines than their uh, than their reputation. I think they are very very good, and we will talk about uh, how we measure uh, how good these vaccines are. But there's still a better mousetrap, and we want something which is universal, which we would last for a longer period of time uh, that rather than only one year. Now, uh, we have three different kinds of vaccines presently. Uh, inactivated means this is the virus which has been grown up and uh, in tissue culture or in embryonated eggs, and it is inactivated. It's not inactive. It has just to be, it has been treated with formaldehyde or beta prophylactone, and the inactivated one uh, is basically the protein, and we make antibodies against the protein and are then protected. Uh, we ha also have life attenuated uh, vaccines, which are given through the nose. And then very recently, we have also vaccines which are made in uh, in in baculovirus infected cells, all by reverse ge by, by genetic engineering. And they are just the protein is being made. So we have three vaccines going on. And uh, we have actually uh, a, a quite good vaccines, as I said. In uh, the season 23 to 24, we have uh, in green uh, the um, two strains, uh, 1H1 and 1H3. Green means uh, they are new, and there are two uh, influenza B virus strains. One of the is the Yamagata-like, and the other is the Victoria-like. And so the common, uh, and, and they have not changed over the last year. So uh, it's some uh, viruses are thought to be protective for more than one year, but in essence, at least one, two, or sometimes all four of these vaccine strains have to be changed. Now, uh, they are really not as good as we would like to have them. In the pandemic year of uh, 2010, uh, we had actually uh, uh, the vaccine chip, that's a blue curve, but the influenza-like illness, the actual number of uh, influenza cases is the red curve. And so you can see uh, the vaccine was shipped much too late and it takes another 10 days until one is protected. So this is really something which uh, we should understand that the vaccine uh, preparation takes some time. And in the case of the 20, uh, 2000, 2009 uh, virus, we were actually too late. Fortunately, this new vaccine I'm sorry, this new uh, circulating virus was actually pretty mild, pretty mellow, so that uh, we didn't have uh, a major uh, influenza year, so that the vaccine uh, really, uh, uh, I think it's one of the best years we could have chosen uh, that we were too late for the for vaccination because uh, the new pandemic strain was actually a very mild one. So uh, this is really... Uh, something we should uh, be aware of that viruses in the inf in in the U.S. can really uh, cause a lot of death uh, between 10,000, 60,000 hospitalizations. So these are CDC numbers, and we have uh, with a, a population of three over 340 million, we have. Uh, between 10 and 60 million cases every year. So this is a real disease, and uh, we uh, would like to have actually something which is better, particularly um, even though we have fairly good vaccines. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the inactivated ones, the live ones, the recombinant ones. So these are done by uh, different companies. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five made in the US even. Uh, different cell culture, egg, etc. So we are not uh, without any uh, vaccines. However, they could be better. And uh, the uh, CDC actually published also the uh, vaccine effectiveness. And you can see it varies between 60%, 19%. But even but then there's also one year, 20, 2020 and 2021. That's when we had... Uh, 
SARS coronavirus popping up, we had no influenza, and there obviously the vaccine uh, was uh, was not needed for against influenza, but we did need it uh, against SARS coronavirus. But you can see here that uh, it can be the effectiveness can be as low as nineteen. Uh, sometimes we are a little bit better, but this is something we would like to do a better. And uh, that's what we want to uh, say. How can we do better <laughs> in having a universal influenza virus vaccine? Again, if we look at the strain of influenza virus, we have a round virus particle, which on the outside has uh, these hemagglutinins and neuraminidases. And that's what we, uh, our immune system sees, and we make antibodies basically against the surface glycoprotein and uh, make vaccines. Uh, the numbers which we saw in the, in the last slide uh, in terms of the eff uh, effectiveness of, of the vaccine is uh, in terms of sometimes measured that you can demonstrate virus, but uh, what is not really in those numbers is that the disease caused by these breakthrough infections is probably much milder in patients who have been vaccinated as compared to those who have not. So uh, one should also understand that vaccination against flu is better than the numbers because the numbers are based on uh, the ability to identify influenza, but the severity of disease uh, is certainly lower uh, in vaccinated as compared to non-vaccinated people. Now, we at Mount Sinai have uh, try to make a vaccine, which is uh, a universal vaccine. And uh, we have, uh, we meaning three different groups, Florian Kramer, Adolfo Garcia, Sostre, and mine. We have identified a conserved region in this hemagglutinin, uh, which is on the outside and which is recognized by our immune system. And uh, this uh, hemagglutinin with its with its conserved domain, uh, the conserved epitopes are in the stalk. So we are talking like a mushroom, which has a stalk and a head. And we were able to uh, construct influenza viruses, which have an irrelevant uh, spike or hemagglutinin head, uh, whereas the stalk uh, stays the same. And so we are boosting then what we call with the chimeric construct, chimeric H8, uh, where we have the tip of the regular vaccine would be H1, H1, but we changed it to an H8. And then we boost with another, uh, with another construct, which is an H5. And you can see here that the only common denominator is the stalk. And we uh, believe that we can make uh, protective antibodies against the stalk by uh, using these chimeric hemagglutinin constructs. And so a little bit more uh, precise, again, Florian Kramer, Kathia Sostre, myself, we are the groups which have been, uh, which have been involved in this. And what we make is a virus where the tip of the hemagglutinin is actually changed. And we make this uh, we sort of, uh, a stealth bomber so that we, our immune system doesn't recognize H5, H8 because we have never ex experienced it. But the stalk in dark red is actually uh, against the domain of the virus which we, against which we make an, an immune response. And we have been in people. Uh, this is uh, the first Bill and Melinda, uh, the first trial uh, funded and financed by Bill and Melinda Gates. And what we have here, we have different arms. And let me just look at arm four here because that's the best one where we start with an inactivated uh, chimeric H8 uh, and the new maintenance is always N and uh, with an AS, ASO3, that's the um, adjuvant, which is, uh, it's a very good adjuvant by GSK. And we are giving in arm four, we're giving both uh, a chimeric H8 and a chimeric H5. And uh, uh, just look at this one. So we have a Lancet uh, paper on this yet. 
and uh, Anders, and uh, we are able to we were able to show here that the uh, stock serum antibody, uh, and we should look at the green curve here, uh, is showing that uh, with a chimeric H8 followed by a chimeric H5, we got we get about uh, four times uh, increases in that uh, antibody response, and it is very long lasting. And we believe that uh, uh, also serum IgA uh, titers are pretty good, that uh, this would be uh, an approach which would protect against uh, the uh, different, uh, in this case, it was a group one uh, uh, vaccine uh, that this would uh, protect against uh, all different uh, H1 viruses, which are coming in the next several years. But again, uh, the proof is in the pudding. We have to show that this is indeed uh, also effective against later uh, uh, later viruses, later influenza viruses, which are circulating in the human uh, population. Now, uh, what is important to understand is that these are not antibodies against the, the the tip of the hemagglutinin, which are the usual ones, but we are making antibodies against the stalk. And uh, they are uh, slightly different in terms of their mechanism. Uh, these broadly protective stalk specific antibodies mediated, uh, mediate their antiviral activity through an ADCC uh, mechanism, antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity. And uh, we uh, did this by identifying in mice. Uh, that a mouse which uh, has, so the antibodies have an FAB on, uh, at the tip and an FC, uh, a, a conserved uh, a portion of the antibody and the FC uh, can interact with receptors on infected on cells. And uh, actually uh, these antibodies are attracting uh, uh, NK cells, also macrophages, and are thereby effective in terms of uh, preventing and neutralizing. It, it's a kind of neutralization of uh, influenza. So we felt we feel that this is uh, a, a new mechanism, uh, a mechanism which re uh, relies on FC FC receptor activity, and one can see that um, uh, the blue curve are regular mice, but in terms of uh, mice which do not have an FC receptor, uh, they are, can cannot be protected against uh, an infection, a challenge infection. So uh, this is uh, done in collaboration with Jeff Ravage, who has been uh, very uh, instrumental in understanding FC, FC receptors and uh, interactions. And we are very, uh, I think it's a very interesting mechanism by which these broadly protective antibodies made against the stock of the hemagglutinin have a very good uh, protective activity. So uh, this is a, a approach really we are reducing the immunodominance of the hemagglutinin head by sequential administration of chimeric hemagglutinins and increase the immunogenicity of the hemagglutinin stock that way. And uh, we were able to identify the mechanism uh, that it involves activation of FC, FC, FC uh, of the antibody versus and the FC receptor on effector cells cells such as NK cells or macrophages. So this is uh, where we are at this point. We have uh, 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 clinical trials going on. Uh, Again, we need uh, to show that group two vaccines made this way are also protective and also influenza B uh, vaccines are effective. It is also, <laughs> important to say we have improved on this chimeric hemagglutinins by making mosaic hemagglutinins. We don't ex exchange the entire head of the hemagglutinin, but we only uh, re replace the antigenic, the major anti antigenic sites uh, and replace them again with exotic uh, 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 
sequences obtained from other avian, from other uh, influenza hemagglutinins, and by sequential vaccination, the mosaic approach redirects antibody responses also to the conserved epitopes, not only in the uh, in the stalk of the hemagglutin, but also uh, in the head, and uh, that uh, has additional uh, protective activity uh, in a mouse model. And we will have to show that this is also effective in, in humans. So uh, this is uh, just to show that, for example, group two, I showed group one in humans, in group two in mice uh, is also very, very effective. And um, uh, we hope that uh, this mosaic approach by which we actually keep some conserved hemagglutinin uh, domains in the head as well as in, in the stalk uh, will be uh, preferred in terms of a universal vaccine. And uh, obviously we have to show that this will be uh, longer lasting. We have uh, used in humans uh, AD, uh, ASO, ASO3, but uh, there are other ad adjuvants. We have used Adavax here, and <laughs> as I, it, it, it will show, it, it's important to show that uh, these uh, adjuvants are really effective in humans. And also, uh, we uh, have experiments undergo, uh, ongoing right now where we use, instead of the protein and the constructs, chimeric uh, and uh, mosaic, we, we are using mRNA vaccines, which are based on the Moderna and uh, the Pfizer vaccines. And uh, this is uh, uh, together with uh, Norbert Party from the UPenn, and we are uh, assessing now how these uh, mRNA vaccines using our, our either chimeric or mosaic hemagglutinins uh, will be protective. Obviously, this has to be done first in in um, preclinically in, in animals, and then we can go to humans. In addition to the hemagglutinin construct, we are also, and this is uh, spearheaded by Florian Kramer, <coughs> we can also uh, think about using the neuraminidase and uh, you know, the new amenities is not is part of uh, conventional vaccines, but uh, they are not measured really. And we believe that by uh, making the new amenities more effective using larger quantities and uh, better constructs, one can in can increase the uh, protection and the breadth of these mucosal of these vaccines. In terms of uh, you know, long last, long lasting uh, vaccines, but also in terms of uh, breadth of protection. So this is basically what we are uh, having. Uh, we have human trials going on uh, for both um, group one and group two uh, chimeric constructs. We also have. Uh, plans for mosaic constructs, and we also are thinking about uh, adding neuraminidase uh, components to our universal vaccine. And we hope that this would be uh, a an effective way for making vaccines against influenza, which would be long lasting and really uh, broadly protective. So we had four influenza uh, pandemics in the last 100 years. We have seasonal strain changes and we therefore we have to uh, make these vaccines every year. But uh, these vaccines are better than their reputation. And uh, we have also, uh, I think, very promising universal influenza virus vaccines um, are going on. And uh, I want to acknowledge that we are, uh, 
three groups in Mount Sinai, Florian Kramer, Garcia Sostre, and myself, but also we have uh, collaborations with Jeff Ravitch from the Rockefeller University, particularly about the mechanism of these antibodies, and also Patrick Wilson from uh, who was at the University of Chicago and is now uh, at uh, Sloan Kettering. So um, this is something which I wanted to bring up and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Palazzi. That was um, quite fascinating and I, I really appreciate you giving this presentation. I'd like to point out that Dr. Palazzi is one of our ISV fellows. For those who are interested in ISV, please check out our website. Um, uh, you can join and become a member. You can see who all our other fellows are. Uh, this series will be listed on the website if you want to look at future speakers. So now we have some time for some questions. What I'm going to attempt to do is to um, allow people to unmute and I can get this to work. There we go. Um, several, we have five different questions and, and we'll start with the the first one, if you want, I'll unmute you and then you can ask your question to Dr. Palazzi. Just give me one second here. Hi, Van Dorian Malin, Malin, you're uh, available to talk. I am, can you hear me? Yes, please ask your question. Great, I actually just asked a second question as well. Um, but I'll allow oh. you to decide uh, whether you want me to them. ask it. Do both of them. Okay, so uh, Dr. Plazy, I was wondering, and uh, you already kind of alluded to this in your presentation, um, but I was really hoping to get your opinion on what influenza virus you think is most likely to cause the next pandemic, whether that would be an avian influenza H5 virus, or whether you think it's more likely that it will be something like H2, which has been in the human population before, but the majority of the population currently does have, doesn't have any immunity against. Yeah, no, I think it's a very good question. But again, the answer is I uh, mentioned Yogi Berra, who says it's always difficult to make predictions, especially about mm -hmm. the future. Now, H5 is an interesting one because I have actually a science paper with one of uh, my very good students in which we identify uh, that uh, in worldwide, uh, quite a lot of people have been infected with H5 viruses. So it's only about 1% or 2%. But if you think that a billion people gets infected every year, and 1% is a high number. So I'm, in terms of H5 specifically, I feel that many infections with H5 have taken place, but the virus has not taken off. So uh, I've been, I feel there is something with H1, H2, H3, which is, I don't know, more conducive to passaging in or in, in transmission in, in humans, but particularly H5, it appears as if this has, has happened quite a lot in populations which have been in contact with uh, birds, chicken, uh, who, which have been infected by H5. So I think, uh, one has to be, uh, never say never, but on the other hand, there may be something really funny about this H1, H2, H3, and that they are being recycled in a way, yeah? that uh, new, um, as new immunologically naive people are born, uh, they are more likely to be infected by H1, H2, H3 viruses as compared to uh, H16, whatever. But again, I think we have to be uh, honest and humble uh, about these predictions. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah. You want to ask your second question? Oh, absolutely. Um, recently, there was a paper on SARS-CoV-2 IgG antibodies that then um, changed them to become dimeric IgA antibodies or secretory IgA antibodies. And they showed that the neutralization with those IgA antibodies um, was much better against the Omicron variant than the IgG antibody was. 
So um, they suggest that the structure of those antibodies is basically more flexible. So it can bind multiple spike proteins on um, the surface of that of the virus, and is therefore better at uh, cross reactivity ag uh, across different variants. So I was wondering what you think. Um, but it would be a good idea to look at mucosal vaccinations against influenza as well to see if we can uh, broaden that cross-reactivity. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of people are thinking in terms of COVID vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, in terms of mucosal uh, vaccines, but also in, in with influenza, it's the same idea. The virus is a respiratory virus uh, uh, transmission go through the respiratory tract so that IgA in the respiratory tract is uh, cutting down on breakthrough infections, but also cuts down on transmission. For flu, we have one product that is a cold adapted flu mist, which actually is based on that principle. And it is very good, particularly in, in young people and young children who have not any uh, uh, H1 antibodies where the vaccine may not take as, as uh, effectively. So you're absolutely right. Mucosal vaccines are a way to go. All right, we have a question from Jean Zaniel. Um, I think he, Dr. Pelosi may have answered your mucosal question. You want to ask your first one? Yes, yes. Thanks a lot. So I, my first question uh, re uh, relate to the, the type of vaccine you, you use. Uh, if I clearly understand, you have the combination both of the head of the hemagglutinin and the, the stalk domain. So I'm wondering why you can't, can't we use only the stalk domain alone as a vaccine? Is it just a conformational problem, a technical problem, I would say? Oh, Dr. Plaza, you're muted again. Let's unmute you. I'm sorry. No, this is actually uh, absolutely a, a way to go. And right now it's still technical. We have tried what we call headless HA mm -hmm. yeah, uh, to uh, construct. And we have uh, more than a dozen different constructs. And yes, that would be a, a, very, a very good way to proceed. But on the other hand, uh, we have not... Uh, uh, been we and many other groups have not been able to make a stable uh, stock only headless uh, hemagglutinin, but it's a very good approach, and uh, I I hope that will be possible in the future. And if I may, I have another question. You you answer on, on the. Uh... The importance of the, the mucosal vaccine. You don't mention uh, any kind of uh, T cell response. Is the uh, T cell response again the stalk protein also important for the efficacy of the vaccine? And uh, is it uh, therefore important to to use uh, the the right type of adjuvant that are able to induce such a T cell response? No, it's it's a very good question, and there are B cell people and T cell people in the flu field. And I have to admit that my prejudices are always uh, what uh, inclined to uh, see B cell responses rather than T cell responses. So there are some diseases like uh, tuberculosis, et cetera, where there is a major component of protection is uh, uh, via T cells. For flu specifically, I like to give you my prejudices that it put, is mostly, and no one knows whether it's 90, 10, uh, 80, 20. I, I feel that uh, the majority of protection is by antibodies rather than by T cells. But again, you will find different opinions. Thank you. Yes, I think Margaret Liu, that's similar to your question. Let me un excuse, sorry, give me a second. Um. There we go. Um, thank you, Peter. This was really such a comprehensive, nice lecture to go through everything. And your work has, has always inspired so many of us. Um, certainly, as you say, there, there have been people, including Andrew McMichael, who way back in 1960s published in the New England Journal that people who had uh, T cell responses against conserved antigens 
did have better protection than uh, people who where it was just dependent on the antibodies. So understanding that, of course, antibodies are much better for dealing with response primarily in mucosal antibodies. Still, could there be some role? And particularly now you're doing the mRNA vaccines, which do generate CTL responses. Could there be a role for uh, them to at least contribute, even though they won't stop the initial infection, but contribute particularly against the conserved proteins uh, that are more highly conserved than the hemagglutinin and the nerminidase. No, Margaret, you're absolutely right. Uh, again, I I really don't know whether we should say it's 50-50 or 60 antibody or even higher. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I think the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Harman Kupers, would you like to ask your questions? Yes, thank you, Ted. Yes. Uh, yeah, Dr. Polizzi, thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, I had a question on, uh, I'm from Janssen Vaccines in Leiden. Um, I had a question on any regulatory path forward. So how would you see if you get a universal vaccine, um, especially if you would also see this in the light of a pandemic preparedness vaccine? So it should um, target uh, lethal potential lethal strains. Um, that are uh, basically in the lower respiratory tract. How could you, in your, what would be an uh, idea for you to, to move this forward, to get this at least pre-licensed uh, based on current uh, FDA and email regulations? And as a, as a more specific question, do you think the, the so-called FDA animal rule could be a way out to, to, to get, get this on the market? Okay, let me, start with the second question. Animals, mice are not men. In other words, the best animal system is ours, yeah, and unfortunately. So that one, I'm a little bit less, uh, uh, because it, the immune system is so different in, in animals, uh, be it um, a mouse, be it a, a ferret. So I'm not sure that will help. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, do I have a better way of uh, persuading the FDA? Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about companies, but we had uh, we talked to people and they heard me say, oh, we want to have something uh, which lasts 20 years. And then I, I had sometimes the question, okay, this is all very interesting, Peter. We really love what you're doing, but why don't you come back in 20 years? So uh, in a way, uh, it is really difficult, but... The, uh, to have a better mousetrap and to say it will last much longer if we don't even have uh, a much longer time to really do this. And animals are, are just not as good, I think, uh, for this particular situation. But again, um, I, I want to be uh, people who have uh, gotten uh, vaccines into through the FDA uh, I think should be in a better position to answer this question. Thank you. Um, Julia McKinney, would you like to answer, ask your question of Dr. Palazzi? Yes. Um, so thank you very much, doctor. Um, so my question is that almost all existing influenza vaccines with the exception of Fluad are unadjuvanted. So what's your rationale for using ASO3 in the clinical trial that you're currently running, um, particularly since you're immunizing a primed population? And getting access to adjuvants in general can can be difficult, and also increase the cost of a vaccine. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. From our uh, experience in animals, again, ASO three was the best, and it was very very good in 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 humans. So that's all I can say. Yeah, and I understand it's GSK property. Yes, but uh, our own experience preclinical, as well as the uh, vaccine trial that we have done, uh, we are very promising with ASO3. So I, it does I, not exclude that other vaccines wouldn't be equally good. Yes. So are you is your thought that the addition of the adjuvant is going to somehow increase durability or just help redirect the immune response to these uh, epitopes that you're hoping that it will focus on? I would say both. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, question comes from Ten Fazy. Would you like to ask your question? No. Um, can I be heard? Yes. Yes. Go oh, ahead. Good. Oh, um, yes. Um, my question is: Which are the uh, favored uh, vaccines? Whole viruses or proteins, recombinant proteins, for example, uh, which yes. are yes. the third vaccine? Whole, yeah, no, it's a very good question. Whole virus is traditionally more immunogenic, no doubt about it. Okay, uh, and uh, the use of just proteins, be the uh, uh, genetically or DNA made protein is more pure, but then one probably needs a, an adjuvant to really uh, check up the immunogenicity. So I think uh, it will really depend uh, what what uh, what can what happens in humans. Uh, and again, uh, I think uh, we will be it, this will be a long process until we really have uh, the best combination of uh, adjuvant as. Uh, in whole virus or uh, a combinant DNA prepared one. Yes, if I may just ask um, a, a, another question. The viruses are grown in eggs still, I believe. So it, yes, it's correct. They, yeah, they, they have changed their, they become adapted to the egg to the chicken yes death. but uh okay no that's a very good concept and i'm am very much aware that by passaging in eggs one changes the hemagglutinin but what changes is the tip actually only we are more uh, towards inducing an immune response against the stalk and that doesn't change uh, by adaptation so the adaptation problem which leads to mutations in the in the hemagglutinin are restricted to the head, and we are not actually using this for our uh, vaccine. Right. So that is not a problem for, right. for our. But the, so it's in other words, we, we are naive. We are we are sort of uh, agnostic about the uh, the platform. We are as happy with DNA made one uh, mRNA. We are also happy with egg bone or tissue culture. It doesn't matter. For us. All right, we have two really short questions as we end this session. Uh, would Rohanda Pasha like to ask your question? Yeah. Thank you. I was wondering if ah. you can comment on the uh, if you can comment on the on the universal vaccine with complement system, especially C three, in amplifying the responses in HA, and also the complement receptors on the B cells in the follicular, which is CD21, CD35, which induces a good response. And, and also to clear clearing the lung infection, you need a CD3. So my question is how effective you induces the complement system of CD3 in either inducing the responses or in, in, uh, in uh, uh, tackling the viruses? I honestly don't, I'm not good in, in this field. Okay, let me, um, I'm happy to talk to you after after the uh, session, but I'm not really uh, good enough in this field. All right, our last question, Dr. Palazzi, um, uh is from an anonymous attendee, so I'm just going to read it to you. Really, it comes down to B. Yamagata lineage has not been detected for the last few seasons. Do you think it will reappear in humans as a main, as a major Influenza B virus. I know you're good at predicting the future, so you know. <laughs> uh, it it okay. I leave it up to to everyone in, in on the Zoom. You know, to I I think it's un, it, it's difficult to predict. I I really don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to end on such a negative uh, platform here. I'm sorry for that. Well, if you have a universal flu vaccine that covers B, then it won't matter whether it comes back or not. It will protect us all against it. Okay. 
All right, I appreciate your time. Thank you for giving this presentation. Thanks for everybody for attending. This was an lively and interesting session. Uh, we will have another presentation in February. Um, and so we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, Dr. Plazy, thank you very much. We appreciate your giving this presentation. Everyone take care. We'll see you next month.